Chapter 10 Sakura and the Variants On the planet Zavarov of the Vartis system, Julie Mizorahi seeks out a different kind of help for her daughter, Sakura. She enlists the help of Dmitry Yuryev and his Yuryev Institute. Dmitry believes that he, sh that he can use the anti-Udu waves that the URTVs emit to clear the Udu waves in Sakura's subconscious to cure her. So, the URTV, mainly the variants and especially Rubido, are sent into Sakura's subconscious domain through an encephalon dive in order to interact with her. This would prove helpful to both Julie and Dimitri as he can use this opportunity to continue research on URTVs and Udu's waves. On their first dive, they're set to materialize outside of a house that Sakura had created inside her subconscious. However, they miscalculated the coordinates and end up materializing inside a closet of said house. There they meet Sakura, who is happy to finally have people who can actually hear her and communicate with her. I'm so happy you came! When Rubido leaves her subconscious domain, he gives Julie a message from Sakura telling her that she loves her. He also tells Julie that Sakura told, told him that she got a seashell treasure chest for her birthday the year prior. He said this in order to prove to her that it was indeed Sakura who sent that message. With this message, Julie became hopeful that the experiments may work and Rubido continues to interact with Sakura both in her subconscious and in the real world. Back in the real world, Rubido seeks Sakura in the real world for the first time. Although he was giving information about his target, Sakura, and his mission, he had never actually met her face to face until this point. As Sakura plays the piano, one of the few things she can do on her own, Rubido and Julie discuss Sakura's condition. Sometime later, Rubido is seen with Sakura inside of her subconscious domain without the other URTVs. They talk about their parents and how both Julie and Joachim are doing everything they can in order to cure her. When Rubido tells her that her parents are nice, Sakura asks about his mom, since she knows that Yuryev is his father, technically. Rubido says that he has no interest in meeting her, as she was just a surrogate mother to the URTVs and he would have nothing to tell her, as they were just bioweapons engineered from her donated eggs. Sakura tells him that he's a wonderful boy and not just a weapon, but Rubido brings up the fact that they are only allowed to leave the institute during war. After that, Sakura tells Rubido that her sister, meaning Momo, will, will be born soon. Rubido promises that he will protect his mom and her sister like they were his own. Okay, if she's your sister, I'll look after her like she was my own. You promise? Of course, leave it to me. Good night, Rubido. See you tomorrow. <sighs> Time passes and Rubido and Sakura continue to bond. Apparently, he even started practicing the harmonica along with Sakura's piano lessons. When Agreto teases him and tells him that he should stay with her in her subconscious, Albedo begins to show some of his obsession over his twin brother when he jealously tells Rubido that his concentration has been slipping, implying that the reason for this is Sakura. After stating that it's almost time for their training in the Udu simulator, Albedo also shows that he seems to be very afraid of Udu, but being close to Rubido gives him the courage to confront that fear. As long as you're here, I don't have to be afraid of Udu, right? Of course. Pull yourself together. Later, the three variants meet Citrine for the first time, and they all seem shocked as this was the first time they ever seen a female type URTV. Citrine reveals that since some URTVs have been disposed of, there are only nine female URTVs left. This scene shows Citrine's coldness and ex acceptance of her fate as a URTV, as she mentions that they are not normal children and that even if they were to die, we wouldn't have the luxury of complaining about it. While the URTVs prepare to dive into the subconscious domain of Sakura, Albedo expresses his disgust for the non-variant URTVs, the standards. They don't even have wills of their own. All of them together just form one collective consciousness. 
But Rubido shows his empathy by explaining to Albedo that it's not their fault they were born with weaker waveforms. Dimitri then reveals that their mission is to find the Udu waves inside of Sakura's subconscious and to neutralize it in order to finally cure her. This will also serve as anti-Udu training. Right before their dive, the standard URTVs are seen start staring at Rubido, questioning his legitimacy as their leader, stating that his existence as a variant makes him a monster. Rubido begins to doubt himself, but Albedo stands up to him and tells them that they are all losers, whose power doesn't even come close to Rubido's. Negredo then steps in to calm Albedo down and to reassure Rubido that they all believe in him. They're not our enemies. It's alright, Rubido. We both believe in you. While inside Sakura's subconscious, they find the thing that's making her sick, the Udu waves. The waves begin to lash out and attack URTVs. One gets close to Rubido, but Negredo gets in the way, showing for the first time that Negredo doesn't react to Udu's waves. The standard URTV, however, having weak anti udu waves, became infected by the waves and turned into... Gnosis? Not really sure, but anyways. After the variants defeat the, the infected standard models, Albedo finds one that wasn't infected and begins to beat the ever-loving crap out of him as punishment for what they said about Rubido. Rubido and Negredo run up to him and tell him to stop it. Rubido tells him that if he continues, the URTV may die. Albedo, however, doesn't seem to understand why this is a bad thing. Both Negredo and Rubido walk away from him and the feeling of rejection from his brother enrages Albedo. Don't look at me like that! Rubido! Later, back in the real world, Rubido confronts Albedo about what he did, telling him that URTV number 623, the URTV Albedo was beating up, is badly injured. Albedo, however, doesn't seem to understand why this is a bad thing, as he thinks he can just regenerate. Both Rubido and Negredo seem confused about the statement, so Albedo shows him what he means. Regenerate! Like this! This is why Albedo has such low regard for other URTV's life. He believes that they can all just regenerate like him. In a state of anger, fear, and concern, as he thought he had just witnessed his brother die, Rubido angrily punches Albedo and calls him an idiot and tells him that if, he's, if someone dies they can't come back. It now begins to dawn on Albedo that nobody else possesses this ability to regenerate, only he does. Most important to him is that Negredo and Rubido don't possess this ability. The realization that one day, one day Negredo and Rubido will die, and that Albedo will be left alone never being able to die, drives Albedo to depression and eventually drives him mad. No! I don't want to be alone! Ah. If you die, I want to die too! Stop it! Don't say things like that. Now you're making me sad too. But all Albedo can do is continue to ask Rubido to not leave him behind. From this moment forward, Albedo begins to, to spiral into madness, and he starts secretly making fake graves in order to prepare himself for the day Rubido and Negredo die. After this, they go into Sakura's subconscious one more time. Helmer, a lieutenant general of the Galaxy Federation military, was in the observation room along with, with Julie and Dimitri during the, their dive to Sakura's subconscious as he wanted to see the URTV's capability of fighting Udu. But we're not really sure what happens as it's never shown. However, thanks to the DS game, Xenosaga 1 and 2, we know that at one point, Albedo makes contact with the Udu waves inside Sakura's subconscious and hears them calling to him. He feels as if he is meant to make contact with them and he jumps into the vortex of waves. However, Sakura shows up and sacrifices herself by jumping into the vortex and pushing Albedo out. Since this version of Sakura is actually her consciousness, as this is the world inside of her subconscious, this act kills Sakura's consciousness and in turn outright kills Sakura. 
Albedo, panicking, begs her to regenerate as Rubido will show up soon and he doesn't want Rubido to see her like this. I guess he still hasn't come to terms with the fact that nobody else can regenerate. Other than the obvious grief, it is unclear what effect Sakura has on Julie and Rubido in Dimitri's experiments, as the moments right after her death are not explored. One can speculate that Dimitri simply moved on to his normal experiments. Rubido made sure to remember his promise to her, and Albedo lives with the belief that he killed Sakura, although it's unsure if he's sad about this for Sakura or because it made Rubido upset. After Sakura's death, Joachim changed his plans for Momo. Instead of using her as a link between Sakura's consciousness and the world, he would try to find Sakura's consciousness in the UMN and resurrect her inside of Momo. However, all his attempts would prove futile, and instead, the consciousness growing inside of Momo seemed to be a new consciousness altogether. Chapter 11 The Three Descent Operations Time passes, and the power struggle for Milcha that erupted with the Zoar incident began to reach a breaking point. During this struggle, the Federation demanded Yutek hand over Joachim Mizrahi as they wanted to get their hands on all the research and data he had acquired while working on the Zohar and the Vessels of Anima. Yutek obviously refused. So on TC4753, the Galaxy Federation began their descent operations. They send in Federation troops into Melsha in a mission divided into three operations in order to cause minimal disturbance. The first two descent operations ended in near total failure as the Federation troops were overwhelmed by Utic Realians and the overwhelming power of Proto-Omega. It also didn't help that because Utic has the Song of Nephilim which makes Realians lose control, the Federation couldn't use their Realians. During the second descent operation, a soldier named Louis Virgil was critically injured after his team was killed by Utic Realians and he himself would have died if it wasn't for Fabronia finding him and rescuing him. Fabrona managed to get Louis to an abandoned church that she resides in during most of her free time. Shion Uzuki, Su Uzuki's daughter, also spends a lot of time here as she's grown very close to Fabronia. When Fabronia takes him to the church, Kevin Wenicott, who is also there, as he was tasked by Wilhelm to keep an eye on Shion, scolds her for trying to rescue him as he is a Federation soldier and she is a Utic Realian. However, he is swaying to letting her save him. He says that it's for the sake of Fabronia's mental balance as she is a valuable asset to Utic. But that's a pretty flimsy excuse for him for helping an enemy soldier, but whatever. It's also worth noting that Shion took Fabronia's side in this argument and Kevin, as cold and bratty as he may be, tends to have a soft spot for Shion. Fabronia! If you want to call the soldiers, go ahead. Fine. Once she gets Lewis on the medical table, she realizes that nothing they can do will be able to save him. Because of this, she decides to do an organ transplant using her own organs to save him. This is possible because she's a transgenotype realian and is half human. She will also be able to live without her organs for a few hours as long as they cut off her circulation but she will need to be returned to Labyrinthos to get the new ones. Although it took some convincing, Kevin ends up performing the operation. The operation is successful and Louis begins healing. Around this time, Shion had begun building a friendship with the transgenic type realian Almadel as she visited her in the acute neurosis treatment facility whenever she went to visit her mom. Shion believed that this was a simple hospital and that her mother was there to get better. Because of this, Sue would often be cold towards Shion when she went to visit her mother as he didn't want her around the facility. On top of everything Kevin was working on in Labyrinthos, Kevin was also working on an operating OS for a weapon system that could combat the Gnosis. This weapon system would be an android, not a realian. The name of this android was Cosmos Obey Strategic Multiple Operation Systems, or Cosmos for short. After one of Xi'an's visits to her mother, Xi'an picks some flowers she's growing outside of the acute neurosis treatment facility and takes them to Louis as he had now woken up and was recovering. When she gave him the flowers, he angrily tells her 
that he doesn't need them, but seeing Xian's sad face, he reluctantly takes them. You won't take them? Uh, uh, th thanks. He's normally a cold and ruthless man, but his time with Xian and Fabronia starts to bring out his softer side. When Fabronia enters the room to check on him, he acts hateful towards her, even though she saved his life. Because he and his men have been fighting Utic Realians for a long time now, it's hard for him to trust Fabronia. He hates the fact that he has a part of her inside of him, and says that he would kill himself over it if he could move. Despite all this, Fabronia expresses nothing but sympathy and understanding towards him. She tells him that she may be a Realian, but her feelings are very real, and she wants him to live. However, he believes that's just how she was programmed, and that her feelings are synthetic, and ends the conversation by turning away and going to sleep. After this, some time later, Xion and Fabronia go to the main room in the church and pray in front of the altar. Feb prays for her sisters, Cecil and Kath, and Xion prays for the soldier, Louis, to get better. By this point, Margulates and Stellars, who are both not only Utic but also part of Ormus, know all about the Federation's third ascent operation. While standing in front of Proto Omega and the Zohar, which is being kept stable by Cecily and Kath, they discuss their plans. When the Third Descent operation begins, they plan on making Realians lose control by activating the Song of Nephilim and setting loose the 27 series Astarok combat Realians, which Kevin has been working on. These Realians are highly efficient in battle, but have not yet been stabilized, so they will attack anyone on sight. During all their commotion, they plan on evacuating their VIPs either by spaceship or via the Song of Nephilim, which can be lifted out into space. Then, Yoaki Mizrahi will be used as a scapegoat, a detail of the plan which was added by Kevin Winnicott. Margulis mentions the Y data and asks Sellers if he has managed to decipher it, but Sellers states that he has not. The Y data is a comp compilation of all of Yoakim's work. Although Yoakim is part of Utic, he doesn't quite trust Sellers, and so he refuses to hand over the data to him. This data is pivotal to the research on the Zohar, but it also contains information about a number of other things Mizrahi has discovered. This includes things like the finished version of Proto Merkaba, simply called Merkaba, the Song of Nephilim, information about the Gnosis, the location of Earth aka Lost Jerusalem, information about Zarathustra, and other things which won't make sense right now. How he came across information about the location of Earth and Zarathustra is beyond me though. Louis and Fabronia spend the next couple of days getting to know each other while he recovers. During these days they manage to understand each other better as Fabronia slowly gets through to Louis's tough exterior. I've been ordered to kill Realians. To a soldier, orders are absolute. There's nothing more important than life. Isn't that true for both soldiers and Realians? I want you to live. And because of it, we are here, together. In Labyrinthos, something similar is happening with Xion and Kevin, as he looks over her as she plants her flowers in front of, in front of the Labyrinthos building. Xion believes that planting these flowers in front of Labyrinthos, close to her mother's room, will make her mother and dad happy, but Kevin believes that this is pointless. He has a very pragmatic and cold view of humans, believing violence and war is part of their nature, which is kind of true. Xion, being a more naive young girl, believes that when flowers bloom, everyone is happier, but Kevin can't see her point of view. Then, Xion tells him to help her water the flowers if he's just gonna sit around. Despite his cold nature, it's clear that he seems to be softer around her, and even when she spills cold water on him... Doing anything! Stop complaining and help! Go on, do it! Hey! Hey, quit it! Ugh. He remains somewhat lighthearted and actually agrees to help her uh, water the flowers. Even after Sue calls Xion inside and Xion leaves Kevin, Kevin actually continues to water the flowers, even if reluctantly so. What? But hey! <sighs> Fine, whatever. By this point, Joachim has figured out what Sellers and his affiliates are planning on doing. Because of this, he realizes that he has to betray them eventually in order to counter their plans as he has accepted Momo as a second daughter, not a replacement to Sakura, and wants Momo to be born in a world where she can live safely. 
Sue later confronts Kevin about his plan to use the 27 series Astarok combat realliance. However, Kevin brushes aside his worries as once they use the Song of Nephilim to activate the Zohar in order to power the Ames in Proto Omega, nothing that happens to Milsha will really matter. This is also the first time Sue realizes that they're going to use the Song of Nephilim, which also concerns him as he knows that they can as he knows the effect that it can have on humans and the effect it does have on realians. Days pass and finally the Federation begins their third descent operation. This sparks what is known as the Milshin conflict. Jin Uzuki is seen in a forest outside of Zaskupta the city where Labyrinthos is, stating that if the Federation is arriving, he will have to retreat, retreat for now. Remember, Jin Uzuki is Su Uzuki's older son, and his contact with the Federation, whom he has been leaking Utech secrets to. The Federation sends in soldiers and the URTVs from the URF Institute. The reason they need the URTVs is to combat and defeat Uru, so that Utech won't be able to use his Zohar to power their weapons. During the chaos of the fighting, Xian's flowers get trampled on, making her cry. Despite Kevin giving her an I told you so speech, Xian believes that if they bloom again, everyone will notice and she runs off to the church to get more seeds. Give her a break, she's like nine. After Xian leaves, Kevin picks up some petals from Xian's dead flowers while, standing, while stating that only people with divine power can lead people to the truth. You know, like the kind of power that a testament has.